right, remember, problems are opportunities for growth. So I want to talk to you a little bit today about the Apostle Paul. Now, sometimes leadership is the desire of your heart. It's something you've processed. Paul, I love his story. I love that when before he was uh, Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus and and uh, he was a learned individual. He had studied, studied under the wonderful teacher, the greatest uh, theologian of his day, Gamaliel, and, and everything. Even he gives this great list of accomplishments later on in 1 Corinthians about, you know, if I could be brag, bragging about being a Jew, I, would, I could, of all people, brag. But all of a sudden, you know the wonderful narrative when he's on the road to Damascus. Uh, Jesus appears to him he, in a light and he knocks, you know, he gets knocked off his animal. And, and this great reality check happens in his life and everything changes. And God is calling him into leadership. He's calling him to be the bishop of the Gentile church. But Jesus says something there when Ananias is fixing to pray for him. He doesn't say that I'm going to lead him in all these glorious places and he's going to do it. But what does he say? He said, I'm going to show him what he must suffer for my name's sake. You have to understand sometimes there's some endurance for the name of Jesus Christ. 30 years ago, we could wear our I Love Jesus t-shirts and everyone, even if they didn't believe in Jesus, would at least give us a courtesy of going, okay, nowadays we're public enemy number one. Sunday, one of our elders at the church, his children, he was, at, he was asking prayer for his children. Two beautiful little girls that uh, we have been in our church. We've seen them. We've sent them to youth camps. We've loved on them, been to their birthday parties, all that good pastoral stuff. But the last conversation they had with their dad, they said verbatim, the church is the problem. Christians are the problem. If there were not Christians, then, the, the, then we, the government could just go on and the society could move forward. But it's this Christian concept that is holding back the progress of the world. Now again, whether you write like that or not, that's the indoctrination of this next generation. The eldest daughter, God love her heart, doesn't want to be a daughter anymore. She wants to be called Daniel. And the older or the youngest kid, again, or the older, that one's the oldest, the youngest one now, again, who I have seen cry on our altars, and I've seen her raise her hands and praise the Lord, but is the same young lady again now that just, uh, uh, again, uh, just this, this, this demonic transition is just unbelievable, and that's what it is. But we know that there's always opposition to the things of the Lord, uh, but how many is glad to know that God is still the victor, Amen. I love what Thomas Edison said about adversity. He said, when you've exhausted all possibilities, remember this, you haven't. I'm under the opinion as leaders, we're almost at the point of giving up when we feel we've exhausted everything we know, but we've, we haven't. We, we, sometimes we have to run into the end of ourselves before we even begin to run into who God is in our life. That happened to me recently, and I know it's going to happen to some of you. You, you've done your homework, you've studied things out, everything looks good, you've got the plans laid out, and it's just something is just going haywire. And sometimes we have to run to the end of ourselves so we run right into the hand of the Lord. I like what Henry Ford says about challenges and leadership. He says, when everything seems to be going against you, remember that an airplane takes off against the wind and not with it. I want you to know that you're not designed to go down in this year. You're not designed to go down in this atmosphere. You, all, God has already given inside of each and every one of you His power and authority. You were not born out of season. You weren't born out of time. You were born right at the right moment to do something for the kingdom of heaven. You're God's answer to a world in this situation and state. You're God's answer to every person in, in Sevierville, every person wherever you go and whatever center you're in. You're God's answer to that community for the problems that they're facing. No wonder the devil hates us so bad. But I hope you're like me. He hates me. I'm glad he does. I'd rather call him call me enemy as friend, wouldn't you? Yeah. I thought he called me friend years ago, but boy, that didn't turn out well. Come on now. But we find that this challenge happens. So we find in Acts 26, the Apostle Paul, beginning his, he's, he's at the end of his second missionary journey. He's beginning his third missionary journey. And he is heading to prison. 
And all after he has been in Jerusalem and Judea, he is preaching the gospel. And I mean, folks, is coming to God. It's just an amazing thing. And, and all of a sudden, they begin to, uh, to, to label him and to mislabel him and calls him. And you know, say he's, he's the troubler of Israel. And all of a sudden, we find now that after he had been in prison, they bring him before Festus and King Agrippa. Now, Festus, we know, again, was the pure greater uh, there of, uh, of Judah. He was the Roman. And we know, again, that King Agrippa, again, was, was the king of Judah at that season. So if you can imagine sitting not only between the leadership of Rome, which was the dominating force of the entire world at that time, but also the leader of a people who, had, who was really, you're looking at a proselyte. You're looking at someone who had given up everything about the kingdom. He was sitting in the seat of David. He was sitting in the seat of Solomon. He was sitting in the seat of the blessings of the Lord, but yet he was not serving God, nor would he even hear the voice of God. You see, family, I want you to know leading also means that there's going to be people in times that maybe that you've looked up to them, but now you have to lead them. You understand what I'm saying? There has been seasons of my life, there were people that I thought could do no wrong. And I had to come into their life and love on them in a season where not only could they do wrong, they did wrong. We have to understand that Paul was crying out in this text for Agrippa. He's crying out for Felix. Although, or Festus, we understand uh, uh, that, that these men were not trying to be heard or to be won by Christ, but Paul is so compelling. If you look at six, uh, Acts 26, 24, Paul is there in that courtroom, and he is, he is making his defense, and I love what Festus said. He says, with a loud voice, he's angry. You ever notice this generation? If they can't combat your answer, they just get loud and scream. That's the craziest thing I've ever seen, but that's what Festus did too. You know, Jesus loves you. No, he don't! Well, how did you... You've got life. I know! We're well, using 14 car wrecks. You know, walked out of each one of them. You've OD'd 20 times. Maybe God's got a plan for your life. No, he don't! Anybody ever heard that one? Come on now. But we understand now Felix just comes up and he just begins to sort of scream a little bit. And he says, Paul, you're beside yourself. So much learning is driving you mad. And I love what Paul's response is. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. For I'm convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing is not done in a corner. Paul's saying to Agrippa, you know the prophecies. Remember the book of Judges written by Samuel? We understood in the beginning why he wrote it so that every king coming would know what it was when the people lived without a king. We know that there was the records of the kings and the chronicles. We know all these things are happening. We know that, that Agrippa knew every prophecy. He knew about Isaiah and Jeremiah and Nehemiah. He knew about all these great prophets and priests and kings. He knew. So all Paul was telling him was something that he already had heard or was at one time told would come to pass. You're going to face two kinds of people in your life and in your ministry. One is the fastest that's never heard of Jesus before. He thinks all Christians are just heretics and stupid people and bless the Lord with the scourge of the earth like I said before. And, and then you're going to have that other who has heard the gospel, has been saturated by the gospel, but yet they still refuse to come to Jesus Christ. That's why I say, guys, we just got to keep leading. We got to keep leading. If you give up on them, what's that going to do? Because understand, it's not the outside pressure that causes the first give up. It's that inside give up that causes the outside quit. I, I'm just done. Can't handle it no more. It's over. But we have to understand what is the ramifications. Paul did not want to be. You think the Apostle Paul got up one morning, go here in the middle of the courtroom going, man, I'm glad I'm here. I hated those days in the, in the offices of Gamaliel. 
I hated being bragged on for my intelligence and wisdom. I hate all that good food and wonderful stuff that I got to eat. He was the one who would have been welcomed in as Saul of Tarsus and welcomed in to the, the highest palaces of the day, fed the greatest foods of the day, slept in the greatest beds of the day, had servants and had all the animals and everything that he could want, and now he's poor, broke, been beat up, been cast out for dead, been treated horribly, and standing being judged as an innocent man. If anybody should have gave up in these tough times, it was the Apostle Paul. But it was the love of God and the love for the people of God. He loved the Jewish people. He loved the people that God, he was, God was leading him to, the Gentile people. Come on, somebody. Can I tell you something about leading through the struggle? You've got to love more and be affected more by the love than you are by the hurt. You've got to be affected more by the love that you have for God's people. You've got to be more affected for the broken folks. Some of you cried out to God when you were coming through the program. Oh God, that I could help one come through with what I came through with. Oh God, would you just, God, if, if you'll let me be a leader. You watch these other leaders stand up. You watch these leaders as they put their arm around others. You say, God, I would love to be able to help one person. Do you still have that passion? Or has it been so much that we've gone through such stuff and we've stood before the Agrippas and we've stood before the Felixes and if we're not careful, we tell God more about how much it hurts than how much we want to help somebody else's hurt. We've got to be willing to lead through the struggle. Anybody can lead when everything's great. That don't take leadership quality. Yes, Brother Brandon. Will you repeat what you said? Uh, it's the inside blank that makes the outside quit? It's the, it's the inside. Let me, let, me, let me see if I can rephrase this. Yeah. It's the inside pressure that causes the outside to quit. And guys, the thing is, is I, I, listen, I've been in leadership. I've been in ministry. I preached my first sermon when I was 13. Oh, man, I just knew it. I knew what my life was going to hold. I had visions of grandeur. I had prophecies over my life. See, I believe that prophecies of God are great. But God never gives us the timetable. And many people have the prophecies of God, the gifts of God, by the laying on of the elders' hands over them, but the reason it doesn't come to fulfillment is they don't let God have His time. God's not in a rush whether you and I are or not. That is one of the hardest lessons I've ever had to learn, Sheldon. I hate it. Because I'm like, God, oh. I remember one time I was, I knew that God was calling me into full-time pastoral ministry. And I was serving my father-in-law and I was where God wanted me to be, but that's not where I wanted to be. I'd received my credentials from the assemblies of God and, and I was making, you know, God, I mean, if you just love people and be good to people and be who God would have you to be, you get to, you get to increase in favor with God and man. It's just a great thing. God trusts you more with stuff and other people see God in your life and they want to be around you a little bit and, and I hope you've experienced that, amen. If, you, if you've never experienced that, then straighten up, live for Jesus, amen. You better be. But anyway... Here I am, and all of a sudden, I'm sitting at a table. I'm sitting at a table. I'm probably 31, 32 years old. And you know how the devil does. I'm seeing people my age pastoring megachurches. These guys, 31, 32, have doctorate degrees, you know, or they have master's degrees, and they've got all these wonderful churches, and that wonderful season of ministry where everybody shakes your hand, and instead of saying, how are you doing, say, well, how's the church doing? How many are you running this Sunday? And you're going, <laughs> I'm running 300, but I only catch about 50 at a time. You know, that's sort of how you feel. 
And then all of a sudden I'm sitting there, I'm an associate, man, and I, I just, I just am not, I'm not where I want to be. And I start sitting at this table with other ministers. It's the, I'm working by, I'm by vocational and I'm sitting here. And finally, dude, my vision and my dream seems like a weight around my neck and not a, a not a balloon or in my hand. And I'm just crying. I said, Pastor, what's wrong? I said, you know what? I just feel like the, I, there's a, the hourglass has been turned and, my time and season of ministry is running out, and I just don't understand. And let me tell you something. God uses people you don't like to bless you. There was one preacher in that whole table was my least favorite preacher at the table. I thought he's snotty. I thought he was arrogant. He's not the guy I wanted to buddy up with. But he looked me dead in the face, and he said, Stephen, why do you think that God would call you into something and not be in control of the time. You're not on your time. You're on his. Didn't like it. Didn't like who it came from. But here's 10, 15 years later, and I look back going, that's wisdom in season. I want you to know the Apostle Paul is not only showing wisdom, but he's showing wisdom in season. Even so much that when he reminds Agrippa of the knowledge of the prophecies, Agrippa says this, he says, you've almost persuaded me to become a Christian. And then Paul just says, man, I wish everyone, that's my goal, that's my heart, that everyone would come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And at the end, Agrippa wanted to let him go. And Festus, although he hated Paul, there wasn't anything he could hold him. But Paul said, no, I'm a Roman citizen, and I want to go to Rome and stand before Caesar, which was his right. And we know the end of the Scripture here in Acts 26 is very peculiar because Agrippa says to Festus, listen, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. But was that where God, where God was leading him? To go back to Judea or to go to Rome? Leading means trusting God in the journey. We say we trust God in the journey when we're on a paved highway. We say we trust God in the journey when GPS says, Turn left. But what about when it's on this rocky, pothole filled, nasty road? And we just, uh, we went to, we were, go, we were going to love, I'm not my coffee. We were going to go to a family's house. It was after a funeral. And there's a little town in Hawkins County called, or actually it's Hancock County called Sneedville. Anybody heard of Sneedville? Yeah. Woo! You have heard of Sneedville. As you know, it ain't called, the locals don't call it Sneedville. They call it Sneedsville. I thought I was country. Mark, no, 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 their country. We went up there, and I had my GPS on, and the lady said, Come, Pastor, said, You preached, thank you for the funeral, and we're going to go up here and uh, come to my home, and it's, you know, it's a country house. Now, these folks are from New York, and they found it, and I'm thinking, <laughs> New York, I can find it, you know. So anyway, my GPS, we get at the top of the mountain, and it says turn left, and I turn left, and I'm not exaggerating. It went from paved road to gravel road to dirt road to a, a cow trail. But my GPS says five miles straight ahead. And I'm like, what? I want to turn around and quit. I mean, we're talking about that little pilot of mine. I'm like, you know, Jesus take the wheel moment. It's just like, good Lord. But you know, the thing is, the journey was rough and scary. I mean, there were houses on the side that you could tell for them. Bless the Lord, them people were probably have, you know, nobody gets up here. They didn't have light poles. They didn't have power lines. They had generators, and they, and they had uh, uh, those solar things. And I'm going, dear Lord, I'm waiting for somebody to come out and say, hey, boy, you know, I'm just waiting <laughs> for this. It's going to get scary. But we got out of that thing, and when we got to the end of it, we had a story to tell. And when we sat down, it was the perseverance of the journey that made us enjoy that fellowship even more. There's things as a leader, you're never going to have those moments of thank you, Jesus, until you stay the journey. You're not going to have those celebratory moments. I was so blessed to see online the ladies who are graduating program. You ladies are rock stars. I'm so proud of all of you. Those ladies look so happy and they're shining. But you know the journey. That's the result. But family of faith, I want you to know as leaders... 
You're going to have, whether it be corporate, whether it be here in ministry, whatever God's calling you in to be, you've got to walk the hard times to get to the good times. Paul is walking the hard times. And then we find in Acts 27, hard's getting harder. You ever prayed for it to be better and it gets worse? What do you do? Keep on pressing through. Yeah, I just quit praying. Every time I pray, you've heard that one. I, I, every time I pray, something bad happens. I don't know. Got up this morning, went out and the devil done flattened my tar. I, oh, geez, Louise. Y'all have to deal with that too. The devil's after me, Apostle Mark. Devil's, I got up this morning, they wouldn't know, they wouldn't know toothpaste in the toothpaste tube. Devil knows I can't go out and do nothing without toothpaste. And I'm just going, ah, oh. okay, I just knocked my glasses off. Anyway, see, coming teaching you guys is just like a release for me. I feel so much better. All right, so Acts 27, we find now that Paul is on the ship and he's heading to Rome. And just as they're heading, guess what happens? You know this narrative? Big storm comes in. Not just any storm. I'm talking about a storm storm. I mean, the boat's rocking. Everybody's prepared to just be absolutely slaughtered and die. And then all of a sudden, the Lord whispers to the apostle Paul, stay in the boat, trust me, and I'll even protect those who don't believe in me. Do you realize your calling to lead will bless those who don't even want to follow you? Do you, those, you, see, see, I say it and I can't remember what I said. If you'll stay in leading, even those who don't want you to lead them will be blessed by your leadership. You know how it is, there's some don't want to hear you. You've got a word from God. You've got the scars to prove it. You've walked the journey. And they still don't want you to say anything to them. Paul had whispered, God had whispered to the apostle Paul and just said, stay in the boat. All of a sudden, in verse 10, or at Acts 27, 9, and then 10, we find verse 10 says, Paul saying this to men, men, I perceive that this voice is going to end with disaster and much loss, not only the cargo of the ship, but also our lives. But nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman the owner of the ship, and the things that were broken by Paul. Paul saying, listen, this ain't going to end well, boys. We don't need to do this. Ah, shut up, Paul. How many boats has Paul been on, you think? Quite a few in all of his journeys. Two, he was an educated man. That's why education is important. Because the thing I love about education is it's not just contained to the thing that I got my degree or your degree. I'm not saying I'm smart or wise, because I'm really not. There's not a whole lot of fresh thought. A lot of it is I've learned, and, and, and yeah, there is some fresh thought, but I'm just saying. But foundational understanding, the more foundational understanding we get, the more God can pull out of us. And God can't put into you what you're not willing to invest in. We've already talked about that. And I'm not talking just about education or formal education, but listen, I could have a gallon of anointing oil, and I can pray God's wisdom in your life, but if you don't pick your Bible up and read it, I'm wasting my breath. Yeah, that's right. I can pray over you, and this, this is the thing as a pastor that's broke my heart through the years, is I can pray over somebody to get through a battle, but if they don't know how to do warfare for themselves, it ain't working. There is only so much I can, as a, as a fellow Christian, as a brother in Christ, you have to learn to fight, you have to learn to pray. That's why the Bible says that one of the first things that Jesus taught the disciples was how to pray. They knew all the formed and the fashionable and all the things that they had learned. Their mamas and daddies had taught them. They had heard in the temple. But Jesus says, no, when you pray, pray our Father. Do you know how revolutionary that was for them? When Jesus said, pray our Father, that's not just some words. He's saying, listen, now when you pray because of me, you're not praying to a far-off God. You're not praying to the ancestral God. You're praying to our Father. Does that not change everything? Holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Come on, it's all God. 
He's teaching them. And I want you to understand, Paul is trying to help them. But if you don't listen to the leader, if you don't go with what they're saying, and you, just because you don't want to, come on somebody, it's not going to end well. We understand that this wind comes in, this storm comes in, the tempests begin to blow, no one listens to Paul. And then verse 21, but after a long absence from the flood, Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me. Oh, I love Paul. Wouldn't, don't you want to preach that just one, one night, one Sunday night? Just walk up. Apostle Mark is preaching. Let's welcome Apostle Mark Gallo. Everybody. We've had some problems in the ministry. You should have listened to me. Y'all have a good night. Have a blessed one. We just got to go. <laughs> Would that not be great? Well, each one of you leaders just take your turn. Praise be to God. But then he says, you wouldn't listen to me. You have sailed and created and incurred the disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss among you, only the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and I serve, saying, do not be afraid. Paul, you must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Again, we read the, the opposite narrative. What's the opposite narrative of this one? Remember Jonah? Paul's hanging with the Lord. He's doing what God says, so God saves everybody on the ship. Jonah says, no, I'm backing away. I'm backsliding. I don't want to go to the end of them fish people. Anybody ever seen Veggie Tales? That's such a good de depiction. You know, and fish people, you know, slap each other with fish. There is a little bit to that because the Ninevites, again, did worship the ocean. If you do some study, but man, VeggieTales did really well. Come on now. Children's church, glory to God. That's all I'm saying. But we understand when one decided that he was rebelling against God, they're fixing to die. But Paul says, listen, you've not listened to me. You, you've not done what I told you to do. You won't believe the God that I serve, but listen one more time. Can I tell you something? Your job as a leader is not to make the other person obey God, but to offer the, the divine wisdom. You can only go so far. I hope that liberates somebody. If you're praying and seeking God where you need to be, you're fulfilling your obligation, and some, somebody just won't listen, listen. They wouldn't listen to Paul either. But Paul maintained the course because the goal to obey the Lord was greater than, than the hurts that he was feeling when no one would listen to him. Are you hearing the Lord today? I would hope and pray as leaders that one of the prayers that you pray every day is God open my ears to hear you. We get as leaders, we're good followers. All of you were good followers before you ever became leaders. And you had a list of things. And yes, in the ministry realm or in the job realm, there will always be a to-do list. Now, we've got to get this accomplished. This has got to be done today. But then there's also the spiritual realm of things that the Lord may be wanting you to do something also for Him. That if we're not attuned and we're not listening, we'll miss it. What if you're out today and, you, you know, I don't know if you're going out today or you're leading a team today or in marketing. What if all of a sudden you're leading this team and say you're doing the marketing, you're teaching or wherever, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit wants to tell you, take five minutes for Susie, she's fixing to leave the program. But all, you, all you're doing is just, you've not talked to the Lord. You know, you've not really talked to the Lord. You're, you know, you're just leading on yesterday's blessing. And, oh, well, I remember Sunday. I had a good time in the Lord. But we're not in tune with Him. We may miss this opportunity. Paul didn't want to miss the opportunity. He tells them again. He shares with them what's going on. He said, you should have listened to me. But I'm telling you, the angel of the Lord and from the God that I serve said, nobody's going to die. Don't be afraid. Verse 25, take, therefore take heart, and I believe that God will be just as, it was, as he told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. And guess what happened? They did. They saw the land of the, the, this, this, this island. We find out later um, that they, 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 they see the island. What was it? Oh, I've got it. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Was it Mead? Not Mead. What was it? Malta. I almost had it. Almost. I got the moon right. Okay, give me a little grace. 
So anyway, they, were, they saw the island of Malta. They didn't know exactly where they were because, again, they're tossed to and fro. So what they want to do is hopefully they feel if they can get enough of that, 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 that wind pressure, if they can get enough uh, forward pressure and they go, they want to hit the island, but instead of hitting the island, they hit a sand dune where the two waters collide. And now what are they going to do? The rudder is destroyed and broken. And, and then this man of God says, don't worry. Swim out there. We'll all be fine. They had the intention to kill every last prisoner. But they decided to finally in desperation listen to the Apostle Paul. I want you to know, family of faith, leading in the storm means you have to have the courage to speak what the Lord has whispered to you. And not only that, but when it seems to be going the opposite way, trust that God is still in control. Verse 39, they're shipwrecked in Malta. They didn't recognize the land. They let, they let go of the anchors. Again, they take these pieces of the ship and help float on over to Malta. Verse 42, as I told you before, the soldiers had plans to kill the prisoners. But Paul again stepped in. Guess what? Sometimes God speaks to you, but sometimes you've got to put in the sweat equity as well. Look what Paul did. Wanting to save, Paul kept from the purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump on overboard first and get in the land. The rest of, of some boards, excuse me, rest on some boards and some parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. Do you think that the Apostle Paul, again, right here it's not noted, but do you think Paul just stood up as a dictator and said, oh, you do this and you do that? In my heart, I see the Apostle Paul, after he encouraged those who could swim to swim, he's over here getting the board, say, here, you can't swim, here's a board. Yeah. Listen, family, you're calling the ministry, and ministry's messy. Ministry's messy. You've got to get your hands dirty. We talk about being shepherds. A good shepherd is not a clean shepherd. I know I've shared this with you before. A good leader is not a clean leader. What do you mean by that? You may be spiritually clean, but you're going to smell like the people you're working with. Hello? A good shepherd smells like the sheep. And sometimes you've got to get in there with them. I know you don't always want to, but pastor, I've already done that. Pastor, I went on this. Come on now, what are we doing? There's no job too big for us again. You've not reached the place to where that is beneath me. Do as I say, not as I do. Don't be the leader you used to hate to be led by. It, oh, there's such, a, there's such a pull to be that leader. You know, well, listen, I washed 20 dishes when I was younger. I ain't washed them. You wash them. I'm the leader. The thing is, could you imagine what's happening now in the heart of those that Paul's leading? Man, he's handing me boards. Man, he's with me. Okay, what else? Do you, you ever notice that? When leadership truly comes, people will just immediately revolve around a leader. Let me tell you something. If me and, and Apostle Mark and Brandon is in New York or Chicago, <laughs> this big old country boy is going to be as close to Mark Gallo as I can possibly be. He's not going to like me because I don't, there's some places he knows I don't know. I'm like Jethro Bodine, Lord have mercy, look at here. I might as well have my wallet hanging open on my shirt going, take all you want. I can't, what am I going to do? But when you're a leader that leads by example and you're a leader that leads with people and doesn't just dictate, things begin to happen and people who could have died are now going to be alive. Because of Paul's leadership, those, those soldiers, their whole plan was to kill everybody. But because of what the man of God did, everyone was saved. The devil wants to kill, to steal, and destroy. Is there any men or women of God that will stand up and say, I'm going to speak what God says whether they like it or not, because I know ultimately the devil wants to kill them, but I'm here to help save them and lead them to Jesus. They're not going to like you. They're not going to always be happy. And sometimes you're not going to want to. I'm just, a, I'm just going to be honest. I know Paul knew he had to go to Rome. 
But I believe when they put those shackles and chains on him, he wouldn't exactly click in his heels going, well, look how pretty this looks. Boy, I like these, ch ain't these pretty chains? Man, no. We learn later about the Apostle Paul, I believe it is in Corinthians, where he talks about, you know, asking them not to be ashamed of him. Everybody read that? You have to understand later in Paul's life what he looked like. Who's got an image of Paul in their head? I want to share with it. Oh, gosh. Physically, not, not spiritually. Um, well, I just have an image in my head because I watched a movie that was about Paul. Okay. <laughs> so. Really cheater, know. cheater, pumpkin eater. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> um, maybe medium build. Brown hair, brown eyes. Beard. Who else? Here, Andrew. Oh, you want to go first? No, go ahead. All right, Andrew. Well, uh, he was. He was. He probably looked like he was partially deformed in his face because he was beaten with stones. He was whipped thirty-nine times, three different occasions. So uh, he went through. You know, he physically he'd been. He he probably had a. Who, he was probably missing teeth from getting hit with rocks. He was probably, you know, he might have had a broken nose from getting hit with a rock and of stone, you know. And uh, who knows where, you know, some of those whips might have hit his face too. You don't really know. So you don't really, uh, but yeah, he, he was probably, he probably looked, you know, like a cancer patient that got hit by a car <laughs> with brown hair and brown beard <laughs> and and stocky build yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry shannon we're just picking all over you said it well see that's what i'm coming to is remember guys thank god we're not the apostle paul and when we feel like that we can't take any more as leaders we have to look to our patriarchs like the apostle paul and understand they never gave up we do see the movies, and some movies do depict it, and I'm not trying to pick on Shannon. She's wonderful, but, but the thing I want you to say is this. Even if it wasn't on the outside, what about what Paul went on, what went on the inside of him? There's sometimes that as leaders, we put on a great front, like where everything's under control, when sometimes in our heart, we're just hanging on. But I want you to know, family, it's not wrong to just be hanging on sometimes. Don't feel like just because you don't always feel spiritually 10 foot tall and bulletproof. Sometimes we have to realize what, what, God's, what Jesus spoke to the Apostle Paul when he had that, the thorn in the flesh. And three times, I mean imagine, Paul's prayed over people and saw them recover and do all these great things. And, and, and three times the Bible says this, the Spirit comes and buffets him. And there's a lot of different depictions or, or under what this could possibly be. But all of a sudden, Jesus says, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. And I want you to know, family, leading, if this ministry is going to face the adversity that we know is over the horizon, sometimes we've got to lead when we don't feel like it, move when we don't want to, love when we can't stand to just put our arms around one more person. And if we feel like we're hanging on, keep hanging on, because God didn't promise we wouldn't go through the battle, but He did promise there'd always be a victory. Used to be an old country gospel song that said, I've got my foot on the rock and my mind's made up. Though I walk through the lonely valley, though I drink from the bitter cup. When the devil comes along showing me an easier way. I stand right square, look him square in the face. I throw my hands in the head in the air. I look him straight in the eyes. I say my foot's on the rock and my mind's made up. You need a battle cry in your heart as a leader. Maybe there's a song that meant something to you in your formative years. Maybe there was a song that the praise team sung that just, man, it was the thing that touched your heart. The thing I've learned is, a, as a, you know, I'm a pretty tough guy, I think. I, I don't cry at everything. You know, there's a few things I cry. The Lord, when I'm touched of God, man, the tears just flow. And dude, I'm an ugly crier. I mean, I'm one of those bellies shaking and I can't, can't talk to you. But God is just filling my heart, man. But that's not my gear. I don't, I'm just not normally that guy, you know. But when I, I can remember when I was younger, those songs, man, there was something about the melody of worship. 
And I don't go back, when I, I'm old, so when I go back to something that touches my life, I, I go by the message and, and even some of the new songs, and I go back to those old hymns or some of those old, because they were testimonials. And now the songs I used to sing somebody else's testimony has become my testimony. And I'll just put those songs in and just begin to play. Because guess what? If God strategically sent Judah in to do the worship warfare before the army ever came into battle, maybe sometimes we need to step back and do a little worship warfare ourselves so we don't give up in the battle. It's important. I'll say this and I'm moving on, Apostle. If they only worship on Sunday night, they're missing the boat. Oh, but Brother Kimry, I'm so busy. But Brother Kimry, you don't know all the detail. How many of y'all married? You like your strong, healthy marriages? How many times do you tell that wife you love her every day? Do you tell that husband you love him every day? I mean, come on. What? I mean, you already told him Monday. Do you have to tell him Tuesday? How about give him a hug or some sugar? Is it okay to say sugar? Come on now. Honey, listen, they just had you young and they know all about this stuff. Was that too far? I don't mean to. Okay. We're all adults. We can't, we can't, you know, that's, that's, hey, listen. The benefit of health is multiplication. Glory to God. But again, do you do that? Do you hug and you kiss? Oh, you did it the day you got married. Why do you continue? It's because, one, when I hug my wife and I love her, we become one again. And guess what? Our marriage, the more we love each other, Physically, the more our hearts in tune together and the more there's nobody else that's going to meet her expectation in my life, nor vice versa. Our marriage is stronger. Our life is stronger. I love the old Indian thing. There was an old Indian uh, uh, statement that they used to say about when a, a husband, I, I, I read, I think it was the Cherokee tribes, that when the husband would go on a, a hunting trip, of course, they didn't have pictures back then, you know, they didn't smile, you know, no Facebooks or nothing like that. But they said that the dad would come, the, the, the wonderful brave would come, and he would look at his wife, and he would look at his kids. And for a moment before he left, he would grab their face, put his forehead to their forehead, and look them over, making sure that when he left, he knew what he was coming back home to. Gave him the fire to get back to the house. Sometimes, family of faith, I want you to know, just like with my wife, if I worship the Lord, He gives me the fire to get back to the house. Make sense? I know you're leading, and I know this is rudimentary stuff, and I know this is foundational things, but remember, if God wants to take you to the next level, if you ain't got a sure foundation, you'll crumble as He's trying to build the, the, the next level. If a foundation can't handle a second floor, then you're not going to have a second floor. Hello? I know, but Brother Kimry, this is one old Christianity 101. Well, it may be, but sometimes we've got to do our first works again. Come on, somebody. We understand now. I'm going to try to hurry up and close, but close like I'm preaching. But anyway, I guess I am sort of treaching or something like that. Treaching. That's preach teaching. You can have that apostle. Use that any time you want to. <laughs> Treaching. So we know now that in, in chapter 5, verse 1, we know that Paul's, you know, oh, I'm not, it's not chapter 5, I'm sorry. But we know too in, uh, in uh, the, next, the next part, of the, in, we know that now that Paul, what is that, chapter 27, uh, 28. So Paul now, he's on this, this island and everybody's safe and sound and it's cold and you know, whoo, it's just frigid and all that kind of stuff. And I love Paul. Paul's the guy, hey, like we talked about him, he's bruised up, but, you know, he's not going to say, go over there and pick up them little sticks. He's going to go, listen, I got you. I got it. So he goes to the little stick pile, and he starts picking up sticks. He's going back for the fire. And then a viper latches onto his hand. See, the island they were on was barbarous. They had no clue of God. They'd never heard of Jehovah. They'd never heard, of course, not heard of Jesus. They were just very kind. Why is it that sometimes those that don't know Jesus are more kind than those who say they do? That's awful. Well, what church are you from? What, oh, life changers? What denomination is it? 
Don't you want to scream? What does it matter? If I come to a jail cell and unlock it, they go say, now listen, where was that key made? Because if it's not a Michigan key, leave me in the jail. Now what are we doing? So all of a sudden they're showing great kindness and Paul goes, they're watching Paul, right? Because I mean, he's like the dude. Because you imagine, like, wow, what's he doing? And he's getting these sticks. And this viper, and if you research that about viper, it's the most deadly snake you could ever hear of. I mean, it's just venomous. They knew it was one and done. You're bit, it's over. Nobody's sucking the poison out. It ain't going, there's no rocks they're going to rub. You're D-E-D -D dead. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. They're like, I don't care. You're like, you did not spell that right. <laughs> So all of a sudden he goes over there and they're waiting for him to die. And when he doesn't die, guess what they do? They begin to want him to call him as a god. Here's the flip side of leadership. Some people can handle failure, but they can't handle success. Do you know what he could have done? Guess what the Apostle Paul could have done? Oh, they call me God. All these people who've been my captors, I want you to kill them. The Roman soldiers that just slapped me across the mouth, I want you to hang him by his toenails. I am God. So hang him by his toenails and beat him until he's dead. They would have done it in a heartbeat. Because this man was bit by a snake that had killed a lot of their people and he's not dead. He shakes it off and has no ill effect. But Paul doesn't allow success to divert him from his calling. I love Apostle Mark, Sister Winnell, loved and blessed, loved this family for years. And what they've done is exceptional. But, Paul, but they know as well as I do, one day we'll stand before the Lord, and it won't be Apostle Mark. It won't be Director Brandon. It won't be Leader Andrew. We'll be just sons standing before their father. In the judgment seat of Christ, what we've done and the intentions of what we've done will be exposed. Our deeds will be judged by fire. Some will be gold and some will burn up. Remember, family of faith, you can do the job and may succeed and, and, and impress somebody. But if you're not doing it for Jesus, you're sure not impressing Him. We find that the Apostle Paul comes back, tells them, no, don't do that. I'm not, I'm not a God. Listen, I, I'm, I'm just like you. I'm a human. Verse 6, or excuse me, verse 7. In the region there was a state leading uh, citizen of the islands whose name was uh, Pulibus, if I can say that correctly, who received us and entertained us and us uh, uh, courteously and for three days. And it happened that earlier that he, that he lay sick and fever and dysentery. I mean, that's, that's stomach terrible. And then Paul uh, went to him and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. And so when it was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases came and were healed. And they also honored us in many ways. And when he departed, they, pr they provided such things as was necessary. I want you to understand that Paul didn't go to the island because of what the island could give him. And sometimes he didn't even want, I mean, you have to understand, a shipwreck led him here. He was bit by a snake. He was threatened with his life. But yet God was in control of everything. Leader, don't be afraid of the arrows that fly by day or the fire that comes at you by night. Be established in who you are in God and know the calling of God in your life will be completed not by your wisdom or ingenuity, but by your willing heart to follow God wherever he leads. Where he leads, I'm going to follow. I used to want to impress everybody else. Now I'm just like Paul. I just want to hear Jesus say, well done. Finally, not only when all, everything happened, but could you imagine what happened in that island? That island, they, they came to Paul. Paul told them about Jesus. Many received their healing. And I believe we don't read much about it anymore, but I believe there was probably a church being built not to Paul, but to Jesus. Because the thing is, it's not just about establishing your, your personality in someone else but establishing Christ in someone else. Dear Jesus. When your leader is not about making people like you, it's about making people like Jesus. We just have to show them the way. Through it all, I'm going to close with this, through it all, Paul was slandered 
and didn't retaliate. Paul stood ground even though the cost was great. Paul listened to the voice of the Lord and even followed it when everything seemed bleak. Paul helped others even when he was in the same predicament. That's what makes you so stinking effective in people's lives that will not listen to me. You don't know how powerful you are in the kingdom of heaven. That's why hell fought you so hard. That's why when you were in your lowest and you wanted to end it all, the devil wanted you to end it all. It's because sometimes when a person's been healed, they can help somebody else find the healing that they did. But they won't listen to somebody that just has an idea, a concept, a pre struct but they will listen to somebody when they say, listen, here's the scar. I went through it and let me help you walk to freedom. That's why you're so powerful and anointed and... God's got a purpose for you in this generation. Man, oh goodness. God takes that thing the enemy had tried to kill you with and turn it out for his goodness and his goodness. It's great. Only God can do that. But Paul did, and guess what? People were led to Jesus and healed and delivered. Paul helped others even when he was in the same predicament. Paul handed, uh, handled success by never allowing them to call him what he was not. Can I do it a minute? Oh, I got to. Now, sister, you could run this ministry so much better. Oh, sister, if they only knew the power and the anointing in your life. Come on now. And then we go, well, you know, they're right. I think they could. I think I'm overlooked in ministry. I just don't feel like that my true value is seen. And guess what? We stop serving. We get this little haughty spirit, this little proud mentality. The enemy understands sometimes you can't, we can't always handle a criticism, but sometimes we can't handle a compliment. Oh, boy. Let me tell you, I got, I got to hurry, I got to hurry, I got to hurry. I have been told this. This is what happened to me, and it's happened more than once, so I know what to fuck. Oh, Brother Kimry, I love the way you preach. Brother Kimry, I've never heard anybody quite preach like you. Oh, Brother Kimry, I am so thankful that God led us to this church. I am so thankful that God has called you to be my pastor. Put my name on Facebook. Told everybody on Facebook just how good I was. That lasted for about six weeks, and then they'd gone looking for the next great preacher. Hello. Listen. Helium will do two things. It'll blow up a balloon and it'll also bust it after a while. It's okay to get a pat on the back, but don't get a helium head. Come on now. <laughs> Write that down. No, I'm just kidding, Brandon. I'm just kidding. I'm going to close. I'm trying to close. All right. He was a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and nothing more. He understood that we idolize him. We do put Paul. Paul deserves every accolade as a man of God. But again, Paul said, the thing that I shouldn't do, I do. And the thing that I should do, I didn't. didn't. There's things he struggled with. There's things he battled with. There's things, his ideas, his mind, his heart. He was not a perfect person. But yet he was perfected by Christ, by continually walking, even in the places that we would never want to tread. <laughs> Lastly, Three ways to lead through the struggle. One, fight against anger, because you will get mad when you have to go through stuff. I shouldn't go through this. Don't they know who I am? I just don't understand. If they only knew what I... Come on now. Secondly, maintain your aim. I mean, knows what sin means. The Greek translation of the word sin. James. No. No. When sin is conceived, what, is the, what does it actually mean? Missing the mark. Simple. Missing the mark. And remember, if you don't maintain your aim, what happens? You miss the mark. Lord, I'm fighting the devil and everybody else who gets in my way. Okay, that's free. Let's go forward and then keep your awe of God. Come on, family. God could have called anybody else. Can I get really real from in the apostle? What makes you different than the ten other friends you had that are dead at some graveyard today? What makes you different than people who will never get out of prison? There's a purpose and a calling. When God set you free, and some of you still, like me, have that awe when you look in the mirror and say, God can use me? Never lose that awe. Never lose it. It's not about the pressure or reminding of, you know, I'm a new creature and all things. I understand that. 
But again, don't you think that Lazarus sometimes in the latter, I mean, after he was resurrected, I mean, first off, I think he was a little upset because he was with God and then God, Jesus, the only one ever. And Jesus is like, wait, you know, angel Lord, I just appear the angel Lord come to come to. He said, listen, I know you're all comfortable and stuff, but Jesus said, you got to go. So Lazarus, you got to go. And I'm just like, could you imagine Lazarus at that moment? But after that, can you imagine too? He's not sick anymore and his arms are moving and he's walking. He's like, man, do you think there was ever a day he wasn't in awe of that? And Mary and Martha who cried over him, who their lands would have been divided because if they didn't have a kinsman redeemer, you've got to remember what happened in Esther would have happened here. Everything would have been gone. They weren't married. They didn't have kids. But now God resurrected him because God resurrected Lazarus. Guess what? He saved the whole family. They're walking into the room, Lazarus, and here he is. He was dead. That should cause all for the rest of their life. Listen, you were dead in your trespasses and sin, but God saved you, redeemed you, and set you in life again. May we never lose the awe of that. Because you'll never win the lost person to a God you're mediocrely excited about. You'll never win somebody from where they are to where you are if you're not more excited about Jesus than they are about where they're at. And it's so easy, guys. Leading through the struggle is difficult, but you're called to it. If God leads you to it, he'll lead you through it. Amen. Let me pray over you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every center. I thank you for every person that will hear this message. I thank you for every person, God, that has stood up and has received the calling of leader, God, through the Life Changers organization. I pray, oh God, for their heart, for their life, for your protection, for your provision, but also for your promotion. God, I pray that they wouldn't always be on the defensive, but the offensive. I pray, God, that they would keep the goal in view, that they would keep the lost souls in view, that they would keep the purpose of this calling in view. That when the rough times come and the tough times come, and they will, God, they won't be a give-up bone in us. But God will continue to do what you've called us to do and not only make this a better ministry, but become better ministers as well. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And can we all say? All right, guys. Love you.